Now we'll hear from our sixth pitch of this afternoon, addressing precision medicine and innovation gap, Team Acumed. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, truly appreciate everyone taking the time to be here today. We are Team Acumed. Uh, before we get started, I just want to very quickly introduce, uh, have our team members introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Mihir, I'm a medical doctor and have a background in biomedical engineering and uh, epidemiology. I'm Ali Afshar, a postdoctoral research fellow at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Um, hi, I'm a postdoctoral research scientist at Columbia University. Hi, I'm Duyan. Um, I run a genetic testing startup in Korea. And hi, I'm Inez Lam, I'm a PhD student at Johns Hopkins University. Thanks, everyone. Now, within the theme of precision medicine and diagnostics, we decided to focus on the specialty of cardiology. And the condition that we really decided to hone in on is acute coronary syndrome. Now, what acute coronary syndromes are, it's a very broad term which essentially encompasses um, a few different things, but mainly myocardial infarctions or heart attacks. And we decided to focus on patients with ACS who were, were receiving percutaneous coronary intervention, which is a very long word for essentially a stent. Now, there are 600,000 patients in the United States annually who will receive stenting procedures to treat their acute coronary syndrome or heart attacks. Now, the American College of Cardiology guidelines for 2016, the most recent ones, will stipulate that every patient who has a stent will receive dual antiplatelet therapy. Now, the current standard of care, according to the guidelines, is for all patients to receive aspirin and clopidogrel. And really importantly, this, hasn't, this recommendation hasn't changed for about 30 years. And the main reason it's indicated to receive dual antiplatelet therapy is to prevent what we call major adverse cardiovascular events, which usually happen in the period immediately following stenting procedures. Now, there are a few different factors which will contribute to the development of these adverse events. Now, it's usually a combination of things such as patient-related factors, namely age and sex, uh, comorbidities, especially conditions which impair hepatic or renal function, uh, medications which can possibly interact with the antiplatelet therapy, the intrinsic severity of the patient's own cardiac disease, but a really significant component is due to genetic factors. Now, with the pharmacogenetic factors, these can greatly affect the efficacy of clopidogrel, which, as we said, is one of, still one of the first-line recommended drugs as part of the dual antiplatelet therapy. Now, the loss of functional allele for the CYP2C19 gene directly reduces the efficacy of clopidogrel and puts these patients at increased risk of developing adverse events, usually within 30 days after discharge. And from the evidence, we know that 30% of patients who experience decreased efficacy of clopidogrel do so because primarily of genetic factors. Now, there is a test. There's a pharmacogenetic test that we can do that will identify these 30% of patients. Now, the problem is you really can't perform this test on every single patient who comes in the door with a heart attack due to numerous logistical and financial reasons. There's no current risk stratification tool with it built into existing electronic health record systems which will allow you to, which will tell you when a pharmacogenetic test is indicated. And more so from the part of the clinicians, there's a fundamental lack of knowledge and time in identifying high-risk patients who would benefit from pharmacogenetic testing. And because of all of this, and from my own personal experience as a practicing clinician, and also from our primary market research of clinicians from a range of expertise, we found that the fundamental gap is that clinicians simply don't know when to order the testing. And because of this, they don't know when it would most benefit the patients they're trying to treat. Now, the cost of the problem, primarily due to readmissions which are associated from failed antiplatelet therapy, is comprised of repeat stenting procedures, readmission penalties, and other medical costs. And we calculated this to be approximately $4 billion annually in the United States. Now, our solution to all of this is Acumed, which I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Afshar, to present in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Mir. Our solution, Acumed, is a point-of-care clinical decision support tool to risk stratify PCI patients and recommend use of PGX testing to the clinician. The solution basically takes into account the clinically relevant factors associated with ischemia, stent thrombosis, and bleeding, and extracts them automatically from electronic health records. And the main goal the solution achieves is 
to recommend the information when this test is needed for which patients. And these information, these factors, are input to our machine learning based risk stratification algorithm, which basically identifies the patients who are at high risk for adverse events. For these patients, it could be fatal if they are prescribed the routine antiplatelet therapy. And once the recommendation for the BGX test is confirmed with the algorithm and recommended to the physician, the test results, the genomic variants, could be input to the algorithm again as, a, as additional information. And in that way, the physician can make an informed decision on the optimal therapy, which could be consideration of alternative medications such as ticagrelor or prosuberol. We looked at uh, the existing solutions uh, and basically the risk scores, the clinical risk scores uh, that are currently available, GRACE, TIMI, and Syntax, do not take any genetic considerations into account and we cannot really consider them as competitors. We identified two companies as competitors, Genelex and Oracle Health System, which provide guidance on the interpretation of test results but provide no guidance on when the test is needed. Acumet does what these companies do, and more importantly, provides that guidance when the test is needed. So our business model is based, to, based on two categories of fees. One, the reimbursement fee, which basically covers the deployment and training, and the second one being the license fee, which covers the support, maintenance, and upgrades. Our commercialization strategy will be to pursue the pilot with the University of Maryland Medical Center, which has recently started an initiative to perform genotype-guided antiplatelet therapy, and we will continue the pilot with Johns Hopkins Hospital and Bayview Medical Center that our team has already established relations with. For all these hospitals, on average, annually has 1,000 PCI procedures per year, and the costs associated with PCI readmitted patients is estimated at three and a half million dollars. The cost savings coming from Acumed implementation is estimated at one and a half, one and one point one million dollar, and we priced our product at 250k with an annual subscription model. This 200k of this fee is basically going towards the license fee and 50k towards the implementation, and these fees are defined based on the annual patient volume for each hospital. So our plan is to pursue the development of our minimum viable product, for which we will need 20K, and then pursue the pilot at, at the University of Maryland, and expand it to Johns Hopkins Hospital and uh, Bayview Medical Center, and pursue with the commercialization. The main challenge, obviously, with any machine learning algorithm was the access to the data, and as, as a research fellow at the Division of Health Sciences and Informatics at Hopkins Medicine, I've already discussed access to Hopkins Health System PCI, uh, basically the data for PCI patients, to train the model. Our team has the clinical, technical, and business expertise to carry out this mission. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I, I had a couple of questions um, around the overall approach. So uh, in the risk stratification, so the, the algorithm already exists or you want, you have an initial algorithm and you'll refine it over time? Yeah, we have a preliminary working algorithm that we have obtained some results and we need to tweak that to make it more specific to the condition at hand. And, and have you guys considered any aspects around the regulatory aspects of the product if it falls in or outside of a medical device limitations? It actually, since it, is, it just provides, it is considered a clinical decision support tool, mm -hmm. and it provides just a recommendation. It is not um, considered as 510K, and it is basically additional information provided to the physician to make an informed decision. The physician's decision will not be completely dependent on this product. And in terms of the regulatory uh, constraints, I've been I had been involved in other projects at Hopkins Medicine, and over I, we have access to the technical development team to develop basically HIPAA compliant platforms, which basically will address the privacy and security issues. Can you talk a little bit about the protection elements of this? It's great that you've got an algorithm. Uh, how? I don't know that you can, how easy would it be or how obvious relative to clinical practice or, or you know, can you engineer around the algorithm relatively easily? 
you mean in terms of uh, using it or? Yeah, like what's to prevent someone else from saying, you know, this is a wonderful clinical decision support tool. I'm going to develop mine for my institution 50 miles over. Yeah. This is true for any uh, software platform, and our advantage would be first to market. And we have already, this, this is a new uh, area basically to investigate. Right now, there are five hospitals that have a started genotype guided antiplatelet therapy, and we will definitely pursue with these first, starting with the University of Maryland. Our, and our advantage will be to be the first one to establish the relations with these centers, you know, and, and to go from there. But I, I agree with you. This is the case with any software platform that we cannot protect it with patents or anything, at least in a meaningful way. Otherwise, people do patents on software too. Uh, what's the accuracy and cost of each pharmacogenetic test? I'm delegate that to TH. Oh, I see the cost of pharmacogenetic testing varies from about nine, uh, sorry, three hundred dollars to about nine hundred dollars. Uh, and also, the big hurdle for a kind of implementation in pharmacogenetic testing has been the turnaround time. So it takes about two weeks to get the results. Um, sorry, what was the first part of the question? I forgot. The accuracy of the results. So the accuracy are above 99 point, I'm pretty sure that I'm, from, 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 our, from our research, the accuracy is above 99.9%. 99 .9 Does so you, guys, you guys mentioned cost savings of roughly $1.1 $1 million a year for a hospital. Is that cost savings that the hospital itself incurs? and where you know, there's a lot of payers when it comes to healthcare. How much of that is shared with insurance or somebody else? Uh, and if it is shared, then who is paying you the, the $250,000 a year? Is that also shared, or, or do I get it, did I get it mixed up somehow? Yeah, the, the customer is basically the hospital. That's true. And that's the cost, basically, the hospital uh, experiences, like the saving uh, for the hospital. And part of it is coming from um, readmission penalties. Um, we did a customer, in our customer discovery for Hopkins Health System, for hospitals, uh, the penalties for the admissions were, were $9 million for year. So it's a considerable, you know, um, number. And the other part is associated with other complications associated with PCI patients that the hospital have to take care of based on um, CMS new, um, new, new basically regulations that they will not cover many costs associated with readmitted patients. They basically want the hospitals to do a good job in the first place, so these patients will not get readmitted. Um, this, this issue uh, has also raised a lot of uh, attention from worldwide, actually. Personally, I have known a, a, a few teams already working on the same issues. Uh, but in the United States, I do, know, I, you know, I do agree with you, the readmission is a huge problem for, for any hospitals. Gotcha. So CME, you know, uh, give a penalty if, you ha if, if your admission rate is high. So I think in, a, in the United States, it still has market, but on a sort of on the penalty side, if you, if you, you know, get too high of a readmission, you know, that uh, the hospital will be rated lower. Um, but as, as in terms of this, uh, this project, there's a lot of people working on that too. Yeah. One, I would say one thing that um, in terms of the cost, each PCI patient, if they get readmitted to the hospital for a second MI, the cost for these procedures is, is close to 20K. And it is very likely, especially in Maryland, it is very likely that these second M PCI procedures will not get covered moving forward based on Affordable Care Act you know, regulations, which would mean a huge cost per patient you know, for each hospital. But in terms of um, specific product doing the exact same thing um, we haven't identified besides the two competitors. We haven't identified because if they were, Genelex is a relatively, I would say, pioneer in terms of providing guidance on interpretation of the results. And we have looked at their documents, like their business documents. Have, we have not seen any other, you know, competitors or at least major competitors to consider. Just our thoughts. Thank you.